Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Well, we're back with historian and naval reservist Andy Roscoe, and today we're going to talk about the role of the monitors in the Civil War Navy. And yes, monitors, let's start. Talk to me about singular, the monitor. Well, I mean, the monitor is one of the most iconic warships of all time, but certainly something that I think for most people has come to exemplify Civil War combat. From when it was designed in 1861 to when it entered surface, it was about 100 days. And when John Erickson, the Swedish inventor who's the mastermind behind it, he put something like 40 patentable inventions into the design of it. You know, it's the first warship to have, um, to have a rotating turret. It has flushing toilets. It has uh, all sorts of things that, like, the, the toilet system on it is actually what gets used on U.S. submarines for most of the 20th century. Like, it's incredibly innovative design. It has some serious limitations and some serious drawbacks. However, um, for when the North needed a go-to armored design in the light of the intelligence that the Virginia was being built, it provided a very timely and very reliable class of ships for the Navy. Well, Andy, if I'm brand new to the Civil War and I hear the term monitor, and I think of ships previously this thing looks different. Take me on a quick tour and talk to me about what's different and how it's a game changer. Well, this is a radical departure from ship construction up to this time. This is an all iron ship. This has no sails. This has no masts. This is armored with uh, iron armor on it. It's mostly submerged. There's only about a foot of the ship uh, that's above the water. That's its freeboard. It ha besides a armored pilot house forward and the actual turret, the rest of the ship is below the water. The, it has a lot of similarities to living in a submarine in some ways and compared to living in a ship. Because of the low profile, it gives a very low target for the Confederates to fire at, but it also only has two guns, which is a limitation because though these are powerful 11-inch Dahlgren guns, they're very modern. There's two, and it's hard, you know, it takes a long time to reload them, and it takes a long time to aim them. So it does certainly limit the firepower of the class of ships. How do they mitigate that on the ship? Well, the great part about it is that they can fire in any direction. One of the main inventions that John Erickson comes up, up with is the idea of this turret, that these two guns are not limited by the direction the ship is going or the orientation or the wind or anything else. Regardless of anything else, the turret officer can point the guns in the direction he wants to and fire them. So that gives an incredible ability to engage enemies. It also means that they can move the turret to increase their observation or to protect the guns if they to move the muzzles away from the enemy while they're firing. Things it gives them a lot of options as a ship that weren't there previously for a broadside wooden ship. Well, Andy, the monitor, I know the story of the monitor and the Virginia and the fight at Hampton Roads. I know more were made. Do they all look like this monitor? No. The monitor is a prototype. It's a one-off design. Out of that comes several different classes of ships. Generally, they're grouped into either coastal monitors, seagoing monitors, or riverine monitors. And the monitor, the prototype, which is she most like? She's most like a coastal monitor. Great. Um, well, let's start there. Talk to me about the coastal monitors and talk to me about what they learned at Hampton Roads and how we're now doing things better. Sure. The, the original monitor had some serious design limitations that came out during the Battle of Hampton Roads including the fact that the pilot house was so far forward on the main deck. It, uh, because of that, it was hard to pass communication up to the, top, to the turret and back. And there was a delay when the captain was injured when that was struck by fire. Um, the monitor actually drifted out of the fight. So in the, the uh, succeeding class, the Passaic class, they actually moved that pilot house on, up on top of the turret to allow direct communication with the turret. It also moved the pilot house up higher to give it a better field of view, and all around was just better for ship handling. Great. Well, coastal monitors, how generally, how big are these ships and how much, dra how, how much do they draft? So you're looking somewhere about a 200 foot long ship, somewhere about a thousand tons, somewhere um, the Passaic class is about 12 foot of draft, 11 to 12 foot. So it's less than a sloop. Yes, exactly. Um, which means that they're great for operating in bay, you know, the bays and rivers right along in the littoral environment. Okay. Well, if I'm somebody looking to learn more about the Navy and I'm learning about these coastal monitors, which fight would you direct me to for successes and challenges? So 
the Battle of Wausau Sound during the summer of 1863, I think, really showcases the Passaic class. In this case, the USS Weehawken fights a single ship engagement with a Confederate casemate ram, the CSS uh, Atlanta. And I think it really shows that the Passaic class corrected many of the design flaws with the original monitor. You know, the Battle of Hampton Roads is this four hour long, indecisive fight. This battle takes anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the account. And there's only five shots fired by the Union ship. But because the Passaics had heavier guns, uh, they had one 15 inch gun as well as the 11 inch gun, they also had better ammunition. They had actually purposely designed armor piercing ammunition. They were able to overwhelm the Confederate ship in a sh by puncturing its armor and disabling a lot of the crew and overwhelm it in a very short amount of time. Um, and it's, a, it's a really interesting battle because I think it shows a clear evolution from a battle 14 months before that's much more famous. Great. Well, let's leave coastal monitors. Do they go to ocean? Yes. So uh, the monitor class has some serious ocean going limitations as a, as a design because it's mostly submerged. Um, the Navy did try to overcome this. The first attempt was to take a wooden frigate, the USS Roanoke, raise off the top of it and put three turrets on it. And how did that go? It did not go well. I mean, they're, they're improvising in the middle of a war with brand new technology, and they thought, we're just going to see how much we can shove into a hull. The problem is they didn't really use naval architects to think about stability and weight. By putting that much weight up high in the ship, it made a really unstable ship. Also, they didn't really have uh, engine technology good enough at that point to push a 6,300-ton warship around. Again, the monitor is 1,000 tons. You're talking a huge, a huge scale of size different. That's the size of a modern destroyer. You know, and look, you don't have the engines to push it at an acceptable speed. Okay, so um, what happened to this ship? So that ship, it basically was a test bed and then went away as the war ended. But it meant that there was other classes of ship like the Dictator class, which did come out towards the end of the war, that really showed some serious improvement and actually showed real ocean-going capability. It's interesting that one of the sister ships in that class, the Puritan, is still in service as a warship during the Spanish-American War. And shows shows that this idea had some longevity to it. It wasn't just a Civil War only idea. Okay, great. Well, if the ocean's a little bit more limited just because of design and technology, I've got to imagine you're going to tell me this is great up the rivers. It's great up the rivers to a point. The you know we talked about this when we talked about wooden ships. The idea that on the river the biggest thing that you want to limit is your draft. You know, I want to take as little water as possible. And when you're talking about putting an armored turret onto a ship, that's a very heavy thing that's all centered at one point. It's hard to distribute that weight. So there's the Neosho class, which is a actually paddle wheel driven monitors. It's interesting. It's got a turret up forward and then is in a very, you know, traditional modern design. But aft, it actually has a armored paddle wheel back there. It's still, it still is a nine foot draft. So it's heavier. It's a larger draft than, for example, the city class ironclads than Union Navy has. But it also is a pretty effective they use it in the Red River campaign. You know, it's just as they're continuing to try to tackle this problem with the riverine concept and apply the monitor. Well, we've talked about successful monitors being mostly a single turret. And we talked about the three turret ocean goer that was just too heavy. Are we able to get the technology more than one turret during the Civil War successfully? Yes. The Onondaga class, uh, which was a twin turret monitor, it was a coastal monitor, came out uh, in the summer of 63, early 64. And that class of ship was very successful. You get to the point at the end of the war where now I've doubled the firepower of the ship by having two turrets. And given that the lack of guns was a constraint on the ship, this started to, this started to make them a far more usable weapon for admirals. Okay, well, let's sort of sum it all up here. We've looked at mo the original monitor, and then we've looked at coastal, ocean-going, and river applications. Sounds like there's a lot going on with this technology in these four years. Sort of wrap it up. Where are we at with technology? You know, for something that it's completely designed during the Civil War, it's a wartime idea. You know, this is not a incredibly long-developed program. The monitor monitors made huge advances during the war, really pushed the limits of, of naval technology, of metallurgy at the time, of steam propulsion and everything else. It was really an idea constrained by the technological limitations of the mid-industrial revolution. You know, it's not, it's not a direct uh, predecessor to the battleships of World War I. It's kind of a cousin because, it, uh, you know, the monitor had problems. 
but it still was something that radically changed how we view naval warfare. Fantastic. Well, we've talked a lot about steel and metal and technology and what it took to move this technology. The stories with it. What's your favorite story in the monitor world? My favorite story at the Monitor World is there's a series of shots of the crew of the USS Monitor after its famous fight with the Virginia. And it's while it's on blockade duty during the summer of 1862, and the photographer came on the ship. He got some staged pictures of the officers, but he also got pictures of the crew. And I think it's great to show some of the problems with the Monitor, that it's so hot in the summer on this iron warship that people want to be up top. It's great because a lot of us tend to forget the Navy and the Civil War is integrated. There are black crew members on the ship and not just the ship's cook or things like that. Yes, there are still issues with integration in the Civil War, but it's far the Navy is far better than the Army in that. It's great to see the crew. It's great to see the this small group of people that took this ship that no one had ever thought of before. They fought through a storm to even get to this battle and then go through this hellish four-hour battle and to see you know, just the very human face of a crew that it's so easy to just remember the ship and forget about the people that are in the ship. Well, Andy, thanks for bringing the stories, both of the technology and of the people to us. Thanks for your spending your time with Civil War Digital Digest. There's so much more to explore here as we delve deeper and deeper into the Civil War era Navy. Join us again.